the music part of what we do. So we talked to the Board of Elders and we kind of put together an outline of how that's going to be structured because we want anybody in the church that feels led to sing, you feel called to this ministry, uh, to be a part of it. We want it to grow and expand. So if, you, if that's on your heart and you'd like to sing and like to be a part of, uh, of what, we, what we do on Sunday mornings, there's a, uh, there's a paper out there that kind of describes uh, what we expect. We're trying to practice once a week. And uh, we want it to be a uh, we want it to be a ministry. People that feel a call in their heart to lead God, uh, lead people to worship Him through music. Uh, so, please, if God's dealing with you and you'd like to be a part, that's how we're that's that's the way. Um, and talk to me if you're interested. We'll start uh, letting you in on the practices and get you on the Facebook group. And uh, the Lord will bless. I know. Second thing we've got out there is membership forms. Uh, we've had one cycle of members that joined, the original group uh, that joined the church, and I just wanted everybody to be aware. If you're wondering, how do I join New Beginnings Fellowship Church? What does it take? What do y'all believe? Uh, there's a form out there. Stop by, pick that up after, uh, after church. Uh, it's got our articles of faith on the back of it, and also the form on the front that, that tells you what you need to do to become a member of our church. Amen? Amen. All right, so that's two quick uh, housekeeping items there. We are in the, uh, the end of chapter 11, the Hall of Faith in the book of Hebrews. And has it, anybody enjoyed this, this, uh, this series? Amen. It's been a blessing to, uh, it's been a blessing to me uh, to dive into these patriarchs and these lives of faith. Um, so I, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I can't promise I can tell you where we're going to go next, still praying about it. Um, but I'm excited about today's message. Look at somebody and say, this one's for you. That's weak. Y'all had that meeting again, didn't you? <laughs> Look at somebody and say, this one's for you. This one's for me. Look at me and say, this one's for you. <laughs> We're all here. Right? I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching to, to you. We're preaching to each other. God's going to minister to all of us. Uh, His Spirit's here. And uh, this is something I think we all need to hear, I need to hear, and I'm really excited about it. It's a little different. We're going to spend some time recapping, uh, going over the, the, the people we've looked at over the last eight weeks. Um, but <coughs> our, our tagline has been, Believing is Living. And I've grown in, uh, I wrote that down when we started this, and I believed it. Uh, but that belief has grown stronger over the last eight weeks. Amen. Uh, my faith has grown stronger over the last eight weeks, the last year, as we dug into God's Word and applied it to our life. Um, I'm excited and hope we're going to do that again today. Uh, but let's just jump into the Scripture real quick. I want to read it, and then we'll get into, uh, we'll get into the sermon. Um, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39 and 40. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time here. I uh, just want to get us wrap these last two verses into our, our study. That way we've gone from verse 1 to verse 40 of chapter 11 and have context of, of how it all fits together. And then we'll spend a majority of our time again on chapter 12, verse 1. I did not cue that helicopter. Verse 39, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Here the writer of Hebrews, he's still writing to, uh, to, to people who were Jewish by tradition, by, by culture, by nation, by heritage, who had accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. I've said that every Sunday. We should have that one, have our arms around that one, who he's writing to. And he's telling them here, although the patriarchs acted by faith, their true faith, their, it was not fulfilled until Jesus came. Uh, and, that, uh, and this goes right in line with what he's been trying to say the entire time. The old covenant was, was, was not nearly as great as the new covenant. The new covenant through Jesus Christ is the solution. It's, it's how you find uh, it's how you please God. It's how you find build a relationship with God. It's not of the old covenant where you've got all the rules and commandments and the things you have to do to, to sacrifice monthly, weekly, yearly. Um, it's not that. 
is this new covenant of grace. Amen. It's the new covenant of grace yes. through Jesus Christ. And then we go into chapter 12 and verse 1. If you remember, we started here about nine weeks ago or ten weeks ago uh, on chapter 12, verse 1. And you remember we took that verse and uh, really enjoyed that message. Uh, it was about the race. Anybody remember some of the points from that one? Anybody take notes? It's ten weeks ago. We prayed for God. Anybody remember? First one. Show up. Get up. Don't give up. That was the three points, right? It's a, the faith life is a race. you got to show up. Uh, and, and you can show up without getting in the race. Uh, you get up, and then he says, uh, he says, run with endurance. Don't give up. Amen. Um, and we talked about that 10 weeks ago in verse 1. But what I want to try to do this morning is tie all this together. And this is uh, it's no easy task, but God wrote it. God, this is, this is his inspired words, and it's all connected, uh, especially by uh, that first word in this verse, therefore. Therefore, we also. Everything we've talked about for nine weeks is wrapped up in that one word. Therefore. Therefore, we also. Um, you know, when, when the writer wrote this, he didn't write it in verses. He didn't say, all right, I'm going to start chapter 12 now and write a new verse. Uh, this was just a letter that he wrote. Somebody later went in and broke it down by chapter and verse. So this... This beginning of chapter 12 and the, the end of chapter 11, and it's just, it's seamless. It's integrated. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which e so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Amen. Therefore, since you've got all this, this great cloud of witnesses, um, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but first I'm going to look at what he says to do. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. It's the introduction. Still an introduction. Are you excited? Who's excited? Let us therefore, uh, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, this first comment, let us lay aside every weight. And uh, we talked about this a little bit before. Um, but when, when I first read that, you think that those are simple things. But then you read the very next line, it says, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So this first comment, let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside every weight. These are things uh, that aren't necessarily sinful in nature. They're not right or wrong. But they are things that are distracting us from God's purpose, from his race, from his path that he set before us, the race that is set before us. You imagine, a, 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 what if a, a swimmer in the Olympics, we just had the Olympics, right? Imagine a, a swimmer shows up in a, in a suit and tie ready to jump in the water. Uh, you say, well, that, that is crazy. You cannot swim. You're not going to be able to compete. Uh, the, the, with the, the rest of the crew, with all that weight on you, the things that are holding you back, the things that are tying you back. And so the writer here says the same thing. He says faith life is the same way. There are things in your life that, that may not be, uh, you know, you can't say, oh, you are sinning because of that. But there are things you can look at in your life that take up your time. And this is uh, your... Your time and your money. That's two places you can look to see what those things might be. Where, where does the majority of my time go? Where, does, where is my money going? What is it going into? Uh, and are those things that are keeping us back from the race that God has set for us? He then says, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So we've got to get ready for the race. He's telling us how to do it. One, you've got to lay off the weight, the things that are holding you back, and then he says there's sin which so easily ensnares us that tells us we've got to be ready. Uh, it reminds me of the verse that says the devil's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Uh, that there is sin that, 
we should be specifically guarded against. We talked about this a little little last week that there are the devil knows us inside and out. He knows our weakness. You know your weakness. Maybe you got a bad temper. Maybe you're easily to get depressed. Maybe uh, maybe it's uh, it's it's lust. Maybe I don't know what it is. Maybe it's it's drugs. It's some type of an addiction. Uh, you know the thing that's your weakness. So what the writer here is telling us, you better be proactive about those things. And we talked about this too, a little bit about wisdom, using our wisdom of, of what happened before and in and, and my past circumstances and, and what, ha what, what circumstances am I in now and, and what are my goals for the future and how does this line up? And the writer of Hebrews is saying you better be specific. There are, there are sin that easily ensnares you. That means you might need an accountability partner. Uh, that means you might should never be uh, alone on a on a trip. That might mean whatever it might be, but it it should be that you get a hold of it, you grab it, you realize the devil gets me there. And if I'm going to run this race, I can't put myself in dangerous situations because the devil will ensnare me, Amen. and he will because he has. Amen. He's ensnared you before. Uh, he's ensnared me before. So he tells us how to get ready. You gotta lay off the weight. You gotta get rid of the be ready for the sin in your life that's so easy that the devil attacks you with, that the devil comes at you with. Um, and then he says this. <clears throat> and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And this is where I want to get today. This is what I want to talk about today. <laughs> This is an amazing thing if you see these words. To realize that in God, he's uh, just heard this song this week, it played this morning. Uh, I think it's Natalie Grant uh, about king of the world. How did I forget that you're the king of the world? And I try to put you in this little box. I try to bring you down to my level. And then I forget, you're the king of the world. Yes. That all these things I'm worried about, they're all in your hands. I mean, it's an amazing song. Go, go look it up. Listen to it. King of the world. And so the king of the world, the writer of Hebrews here is saying, the king of the world has set a race, set a path before us, before you, before me, before our church, a purpose. Is that powerful? That you're trying to figure it out. You don't know why you're here. Sometimes you think you're useless. Sometimes I wake up and think, why? Uh, this day, uh, can it be worse than the last day? Um, but the devil gets you there. The devil will get you there. But the writer here says there's a race. There's a purpose for you. There's a purpose for me in God's big picture and his story. The race that is set before us. So we got the beginning of this verse that says, therefore, we also, therefore, and I'm going to take that just for a minute. I'm going to recap what that means. Why is that important? Why does he say, therefore, by faith? Uh, let's look at these just for a moment. By faith, Abel. Remember Abel? What we learned about Abel, he said, it's not what you do, but it's why you do it. Yes, it's that, that Abel looked down, God looked down upon Abel's heart, and he saw that Abel was sincere when he made the sacrifice, and it pleased God. Yeah. It wasn't about how much he gave or what he gave. It was, uh, it was because his heart was right. Yeah. So, therefore, since you see Abel, and by faith, he served God and pleased God because he, his heart was right about why he did his actions. Uh, therefore, you, you, you can run this race with endurance and you can finish this race. Therefore, Enoch, Enoch was taken up by God. So he, just, he was with God. He never died. And we talked about Enoch and we said that, uh, that don't just seek God, but expect his response. He walked with God in this close relationship uh, with God. Yeah. Then we talk about Noah. Uh, Noah says, uh, we, we thought about Noah and we said, if he's here testifying, and that's what really 
chapter 12, verse 1 is saying is, based on all the testimony of these former, these people across ages of history who had faith in Jesus Christ, look at what God did through them and for them. Therefore, let us. Look at what God did through them for them. We looked at Noah and we said it's not about what we know in life. It's about what we don't. Amen. And that we got to trust God. Amen. God looked down on Noah and said, hey, it's going to rain. You need to build a, a, a big boat. And Noah had never seen rain. Noah uh, had, had, had no idea. Uh, I don't know if he can understand what a flood was. Yeah, what did he do? He built his ark on dry land. There are going to be times in the faith life that God's going to call us into positions, into, into ministries, into buildings, into services that make absolutely no sense. That people will look around and say, Noah, you've lost your mind. You're building your ark on dry land. It's never rained before. What are you doing? Remember we said, be faith crazy. Mm -hmm. Say that. Everybody say, be faith crazy. Uh, if we're going to let God rule in our life, we're going to let His purpose, the path that's set before us, that's His path, then He expects us to be faith crazy. Then we talked about Abraham and uh, two things about him, his journey of faith, when God just called him out of his home, said, I need you to go to the, to, to the promised land. I'm going to give it to you. And we talked about the decision that Abraham had to make to step out of that comfort zone. Um, that that we thought, well, he was he was uh, he was responsive in that he was an obedient. He left just like God asked him to do. And when he when he did, what do you think? Surely by the end of his life, he's he's got all these children and he's got all this property. And we find that in his lifetime, it didn't happen. He had two children. He still hadn't made it to the promised land. But he still had the faith. He, he, he stepped out of, the, out of that land in faith, and he died in faith. Um, so we talked about it being about the heavenly city. He had his side on the heavenly city, on God's rewards, not earthly rewards. We talked about him passing the test, and we already talked about that uh, a little bit. He teaches, God teaches through the test, not to the test. And I'm thankful for that. He, he's not just, he's not teaching you something, going to test you to see if you learned it. If you're going through a hard time, it's to learn something. Amen. It's to gain your trust. The trying of your faith is more precious than the gold tried by fire. Yes. The trying of your faith. He teaches through the test, not to the test. Amen. We learned that we've got to be ready to give up our idols. The idols in our life. The, uh, remember we wrote the three things that we felt like God had blessed us with. And then we talked about at the end of the message how those things, although they're good in nature, Isaac was the blessing from God to fulfill promise. But it's real easy in those blessings uh, to get all our hope wrapped up in them and they can become idols in our life. And all God wants is for us to be ready to give it up Amen. for him. Then we talked about Isaac, we talked about Jacob, we talked about Joseph, all in their dying days. They were, they, were, they were not looking back over their entire life. They were not thinking about all the good memories, the bad memories, the things they regretted. They were blessing their children for the future. They were speaking confidence into their children. They were speaking confidence into their grandchildren. And they were trusting God for the promises that he had made. We found three things about the future in that passage. God has a plan for it. Uh, he reveals it to his children. And through us, he impacts it. Amen. Through us, he impacts it. Then we looked at Moses' parents. By faith, Moses' parents. Remember his mom. Uh, his parents were Amram and Jochebed. That's some rough names, isn't it? Can you imagine that being your name, Amram and Jochebed? You're, that's tough. Um, nevertheless, they had faith. His mom had faith. She put him in a basket and set him down by the river. 
And she didn't know how all the details were going to work out. She was just obedient. And we found that, that in, in that story of Moses' parents, and by faith what they did, uh, he was saved. He ended up in the, 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 um, the, the, in the Pharaoh's house with the Pharaoh's daughter, found him. His real mom ended up nursing him and getting paid to do it. And we found out that in our life, God takes care of the details. When you're obedient to God, he takes care of the details. He didn't tell Moses' parents. He didn't tell Abraham. He didn't tell Isaac, Jacob. He didn't say, he didn't say figure out all the details and then go do this. He makes a promise, and then he gives a command. Yeah. Just be obedient. Trust God for the details. We can't control everything. We find Moses and the decision he made when at 40 years old he he, he walked away from fame and fortune and all that he could have had in Pharaoh's court. Could have been Pharaoh. And we talk about making decisions in our life. Moses made decisions based on godly principles. He didn't make uh, decisions based on uh, money or power or wealth or fame or, or emotions, we found out. Sometimes we want to make decisions on emotions. That usually results if it's a buying decision and buyer's remorse. You ever had that? You know, that, that, that's the TV I've been wanting for so long. I, they, got, they got six months, same as cash. Let's do it. We're doing it. Let's just do it today. I'll be so happy at this football game. This, well, it depends on who's playing. But I'll be so happy if I have that TV and I can relax in front of it and enjoy it. And you do for like a day. And then it's, you know, 30 days in, it's, you know, it's just another thing in your house. And then the bill comes. And you're like, oh, why? 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 It wasn't worth it. But we make decisions based on emotion. And we talked about how Moses very easily could have made decisions based on emotion when he led the children of Israel out, he got them to the Red Sea. They were all complaining, and he had no hope, no way out, that he could have really easily just said, fine, you can have it. You're going to complain. You're going to bicker. You're going you're to say you wish you were still slaves in Egypt. Fine. That's emotion. But Moses made decisions through obedience to God. Amen. By faith. Moses, by faith Joshua, and the walls of Jericho, they crumbled because he had faith and obedience to God. Rahab, she says, she'd say, I, I, I was a nobody. I was a prostitute. I didn't deserve grace. I didn't deserve mercy. I didn't deserve to be a part of God's plan. But he used me to alter the course of history. You may say this morning, I've messed up so many times. I've done so many bad things. I've been out of God's will so many times. There's no way that I could be used in God's plan. And God said, that's why I sent my son. <laughs> that mercy and grace that when your heart is right and you come and seek it, you can find it. I will give it. Amen. Mercy and grace. <laughs> and then the writer says this. Basically says, I'm out of time. It's chapter 11. I'm out of time. I've listed all these. I've gave you a little insight into each one by faith, but there's too many to mention. Uh, David, Gideon, Barak, all these leaders of the Old Testament. I'm out of time. And, and he talks about how they changed the world. He talked about the, the hard times, the trials they went through. And then he gets to, therefore, therefore we also, since, since you can see all this testimony, all these people who've witnessed what God can do, since you've seen that, then, then we also, should get our life ready. We should lay off the things that distract us. 
the worldly things that, that, that entice us. We should be righteous in our life and get the sin outside of our life. And he says, therefore, we also should run the race the set before us. This was in, uh, you know, right after, this was written 2,000 years ago, roughly, in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. He wrote by faith then, and there have been so many people in the last 2,000 years that have taken that to heart. Yes, amen. That therefore we also should run the race that is set before us. Uh, th this is the, I don't know if it's a title, but it's my thought for today. By faith, what's our story? What's your story? What's my story? Have I bought in to this idea that, that God has got a race set before me? Yes. And that that's the race I want to be in? Yes. Or am I still living in the world that I know God has a plan and a purpose? But I like the course I'm on. Or you may be to the point that you don't even believe that God has a purpose for your life. And that you think is everything by happenstance and chance and just uh, every day is good. If it's, if it's good, it's by chance. If it's bad, it's by chance. But I live under the belief that God is in sovereign control Amen. of everything that happens in our life. That he uses it for his good. If it's good, if it's bad. Yesterday, uh, we woke up yesterday morning. I walked downstairs and was getting ready to walk into the kitchen. I put my foot down in the hallway downstairs. It's wood floor, and it felt cold. I thought, that's cold. Why is that cold? It's colder than the rest. So I put my foot up, and you know, I felt it, and it was wet. I was like, oh, no, why is that wet? It's bad that it's cold, but it's worse that it's wet. Why is the floor wet? So about that time, I kind of look it up. And a drop of water hits me right between the eyes. And then I'm like, oh no, what, what is happening? It's right under the bathroom upstairs. So I'm thinking, all right, the toilet, the what, some of the, the tub, the sink, what's, what's going on? So I run upstairs and I get toward the bathroom and I step and it's really wet. And I get to the end of the bathroom and it's a lot more wet. <laughs> And I look, and all this, I mean, it, was, it drew down, the, when I went back down, the ceiling was soaking wet. It was coming through the, the, the trim around our door face, and it was just dripping out paint. Was, and I looked when I got back to the bathroom, and our faucet, uh, it's one of these fancy looking faucets, looks like a water spout or something. Uh, one of us had either bumped it or not got it turned all the way off. And it, it was just running enough that it wasn't going down the sink. It was running back under the faucet, down the faucet, onto the counter. Like just, a, I mean, it was the smallest stream of drops. I thought, that probably wouldn't fill a cup up overnight. And the floor was covered. It, I mean, and I was just like, well, ceiling's wet, floor's wet, dry it up dehumidifier, I don't know what, I, this is just one of those days. It's, it's what happens. It would be really easy for me to start thinking, uh, like adding up how much that trim costs, how much that ceiling sheetrock's going to cost to get refinished, how much the floor, the wood's like bubble a little bit. And Beth is probably, she was adding all that up. I could see it all over her face. Uh, and I was just like, that's really bad, but I got a house, I got a floor to fix, I got a ceiling, I got a faucet. Their people don't have that.
I think crazy thoughts like, well, maybe that happened because there's some guy out there that does a handyman job that needs some work. I'm crazy. I start thinking like that. Well, all right. If that's why you meet a guy that he, if somebody needs some work, let, all right, flood my kitchen, flood whatever. <laughs> Beth does not like this attitude. <laughs> she, she comes around to it eventually. But I just trust him so much. And I didn't trust him that much a year ago. But I trust him that much. Just whatever. If, if my job is gone tomorrow, whatever. It's yours, God. My life is yours. This, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, it's yours. By faith, there was a man named Edward. That, a man named Edward. <laughs> Siri, you didn't hear me well. There was a man named Edward. And uh, he, was a, he was a Sunday school teacher. He was a uh, Sunday school teacher in, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. Loved teaching Sunday school. Felt called to teach Sunday school. Wanted the children in his Sunday school to get saved, to know God, to trust in Jesus, to live the faith life, not their life, and not just a random life that they, they, they get out and they, they have no focus and they have no purpose. They're not, they've not gotten in line with God. He wanted them to have that life, and, and, and he, would, he would pray for them, and he would teach every Sunday. He had this burden, and uh, there was a student that came in um, one, one morning, and he started coming consistently, and his name was Dwight. And uh, Dwight would fall asleep during class. Uh, but this Sunday school teacher, Edward, uh, he just had a burden for this little boy. So he went and found, he went to where Dwight was working. Dwight was about 17 years old. He had moved to Boston. He grew up in, in another part of Massachusetts. Um, and he, he moved to Boston to live with his uncle and work for his uncle in a shoe shop. And so this Sunday school teacher goes to the shoe store, finds Dwight, and basically tells him, you've got to find Christ in your life. I don't, I don't, I don't know what it is. But I have a burden for you. I'm praying for you. I want you to get saved. And he went to him, and, and he prayed for him there, and he talked to him, and he witnessed to him, and he left feeling like a failure. He felt like you know, he didn't make a profession of faith there, and, uh, and he felt like he had failed. But by faith, Edward had taught Sunday school. This is his story. By faith, he felt God tell him, go talk to this little this 17-year-old boy that's working at a shoe store and uh, share the gospel with them in a personal way. So he goes and shares the gospel, he leaves, and little does he know that this little boy, Dwight, um, actually finds Jesus that day. He gets saved that day. And he begins to get passionate about Jesus and he wants to teach about Jesus and God's got a hold of his heart so now therefore we also was Edward now therefore we also is Dwight God saved Dwight. God's got a brace set before Dwight, a purpose in his life, a way in his life, a path set before him. Dwight decides that's the path I want to be on. That path takes him to Chicago, Illinois. Uh, he gets there. He's, he's gotten saved, but God has got a hold of his heart, and he's trying to figure his life out. But he loves the shoe business. He's going to make a fortune in the shoe business when he gets to Chicago, and he'll serve God when he can. And it wasn't long after being in Chicago, he got involved in the YMCA and different leadership groups. And God got a hold of his heart. Before long, he had left the shoe business. No longer was he making decisions about money and fame and wealth. 
So by faith, Dwight had moved to Chicago. By faith, Dwight left his business uh, that he thought he was going to make a fortune in. And he began preaching and teaching. Uh, in 1873, he went to Liverpool, England. This was back in the 1800s. Preached a series of crusades. He visited a Baptist church pastored by a man named F.B. Meyer, who was first discontent with. He really didn't think much of Dwight, but he decided to let him come and preach, and he fell in love with his preaching. Dwight invited him to come back over to America. He came to America, and he went around preaching crusades. He made this remark at one of the places by faith. This Meyer, who'd been inspired by Dwight to come to America, was preaching once. He made this comment If you're not willing to give up everything for Christ, are you willing to be made willing? And there's a young minister there, that service, named J. Wilbur Chapman. So, by faith, Wilbur, who's decided God's got a path set before me. Therefore, we also should run this race that's set before us. So, by faith, Wilbur Chapman uh, became a traveling evangelist in the early 1900s. And he recruited a, a baseball player named Billy Sunday to be a part of his crusades. Billy Sunday and Wilbur Chapman found themselves in a campaign in Charlotte, North Carolina. In 1934, they invited evangelist Mordecai Ham to conduct a citywide crusade. And October 8th, <coughs> Ham had been discouraged because it wasn't going the way he thought it should go. And he wrote a prayer to God on the stationery of his Charlotte Hotel. It said, Lord, give us a Pentecost here. Pour out thy spirit tomorrow. The next day, there was a, uh, a young Central High School student that got saved named Billy Grant. First guy in white was D.L. Moody. You've heard of Moody Bible Institute. If you listen to 90.1 and you hear Moody Radio. By faith, Edward. By faith, Dwight. Yes. By faith, Meyer. By faith. That's how God works. Amen. There was people through the race that set before you. Through the race that set before us. This is my thought. This is my excitement. That's just one story. You think that's contradiction? You think that's happenstance? You think God didn't know Billy Graham before he was born? You think God didn't know the, the crusades he could preach? You think Edward... When God called Edward to teach Sunday school, you think God didn't know about Billy Graham? You think when God called your spouse to Christ, he wasn't thinking about you? You think that when you got saved, he wasn't thinking about your church and the next generation and your family? You think God doesn't have a, a race, a path set out for us? What I want us to pray about is by faith, New Beginnings Fellowship Church. Amen. What's going to be our story? What's God going to, what's God going to look at? What will the, the people in 10 years from now look back and say, by faith, New Beginnings Fellowship Church, they rented a five-star limousine place over on College Street. Because we did that. By faith, New Beginnings Fellowship Church rented a, uh, a 
run down, falling apart boxing gym with busted out windows and doors. You think when God lays that on somebody's heart in our congregation, in our church, that God doesn't have some little kid over there in mind? The kid, the kids, the families, the people. It's not about a space. It's not about what we're going to do. It's by faith, New Beginnings Fellowship Church is going to build an ark on dry land. We're going to do things that don't make sense. But when God moves and he can see, we're going to trust him. Not our gut, not our, not our, not not what we think feels right, and it's what's good and what what makes it easy on us. It, it, God does not call people to comfort and complacency. Uh, we want to get there so bad. I want to be there so bad. I want to have a. I want to have a peaceful, easy, just every day and on the beach or whatever. Like that's we all want that. But God has not called me there. He's not called us there. He's not called our church there. Tell me who he called there in the Bible that said, now you can retire and relax and God's kingdom on earth is, you've done enough. He calls us to work. Amen. Why does he call us to work? Because there are lives at stake. Amen. Guess what? If we work a hundred years on this earth, it's not going to amount to anything compared to eternity Amen. in heaven. He, he, he sees, he knows by faith, New Beginnings Fellowship Church. I want to share with you just a little bit about what our church has been able to do as we get ready to close over the, the last year. Um, we've, uh, we just recently provided 1,400 juice pouches uh, for Valley Elementary's backpack program. Last Christmas, we bought uh, 12 foster children Christmas presents. We bought them iPads, laptops. We bought them, if they wrote down what they wanted, we got what they wanted. You think, well, you gave a gift. By faith, we were obedient. That opportunity came. God, we felt moved to do it. There's some kid Learned how to use an iPad, learned how to use a laptop, may make a living to that. We don't know. We don't know what God is moving and how he's doing and what he's doing. Uh, we provided 35 turkeys last year, Thanksgiving, to uh, the Youth Service Center at Pikeville Elementary. Um, we have taken probably almost monthly donations of cleaning, cleaning supplies and food by our youth group to the West Care, the homeless shelter. Did a Socks of Love drive for West Care. We helped at UPI move-in day last year, provided orange leaf cards. We've opened the center over on College Street. It used to be the five-star limousine. Uh, every time we're there, somebody shows up needing something. And um, God's going to use that space in a big way. Uh, we're still getting our arms around how we're going to use it and what we're going to do with it. But it's busy. Uh, it's getting used a lot. And I know he's going to do a lot more with it. Uh, we've rented the gym that we're calling the Battle Line. Um, we did a football kickoff for the teens. When high school football started this year, we fed them all at the center, had a big get-together for them. We did War Room and a dinner for Valentine's Day last year. We're supporting pastors in Gulu, Uganda um, each month. We were doing the crafting. Um, we've donated to several funerals and food and gift baskets for funerals. Uh, we bought Bibles and books. We've had people saved and, and baptized. Um, we raised over $500 for Appalachian Pregnancy Care Center. Uh, someone donated for the Children's Church curriculum, this new gospel project we were talking about. It. Somebody came up and said, I want to cover however much that costs. We're going to take care of it. By faith. Amen. We fed people every Sunday morning. We've got um, just at the end of August, uh, our church and what you've been, we've done all that, and that's a lot. We rent this space, we rent the center, 
and we had uh, a, a special gift to cover the first year's rent at the boxing gym. We've done all this, and we have over a hundred thousand dollars. I'd love to have a permanent place. Would you love to have a building? Amen. We're going to someday. God's got it. Uh, hey, we've looked at different buildings. Every route we've we've gone down, it's just it's not it's not the right time. Hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money, but when everything's a million, it's not a lot of money. Uh, but what what we're going to do is change people's lives right now. We're going to serve by faith. New Beginnings Fellowship Church is going to serve and give and change and transform people's lives and the community that we're in. And we're going to make a difference. Amen. And when it's God's time for us to have a building, we're going to have a building. We were in Louisville yesterday. We drove by this church that had, uh, it had a steel, like a wrought iron gate over the doors. And it looked rough. And... You know, I, I'm going to try to remember. I wish I'd have got a picture of, of that church every time that I get discontent because I'm carrying my keyboard into a million dollar building. Um, God has blessed us more than you can you can imagine, Amen. and He's going to bless even more. So I want to ask you this morning. I want to leave you with this thought. If you've got notes, if you've got your Bible. I want you to write that by faith, and I want you to put your name. I just want you to put your name. And I want you to think about that. I want you to pray about it. Take some time today and think by faith. Uh, and this is really similar to what we've done with Brother Kelsey of experiencing God. Because you could, by faith, if someone was going to come ask you, why should I get in this race? If the writer of Hebrews was going to add another verse to Hebrews 11, and it said, by faith, Jared, or by faith, Kelsey, or, or by faith, Sharon, by faith, your name, what, what did he write? What the writer of Hebrews is really saying in verse 1, he's not saying we're special any more than the last generation or the next generation or the church beside us. or uh, He's not saying any of that. All he's saying is this. It's our turn. Amen. It's our turn to get in the race, to trust God. It's your turn. To, it, this faith life is a baton passed from one to the next. Uh, somebody in your family, somebody you knew, served God the this is from one to the next. All he's saying is, therefore, you see all these lives have been changed by faith. You cannot doubt the power of God. Look around you. Look at the people across history and the plan that God has, has unfolded exactly as he said it would in the, this book that, that never contradicts itself. There's no question that God is all-powerful and real. And it's your turn. You've accepted him. It's your turn. It's our turn to be a part of God's plan. Amen. As we stand and close, I'm so thankful for the uh, the leadership of our church, uh, the elders, the, the members, the, the, the attendees who have given faithfully, who have, uh, who have led faithfully, who have um, shown up wherever we were meeting that Sunday morning. Uh, I told Beth we were driving this morning. 
I said, my greatest fear, this is my greatest fear, is that we get to church one Sunday morning and like nobody shows up. <laughs> like every morning, you know, I'm in here getting stuff ready. And every morning about 10 to 11, I go out and peek just to make, are there people out there? I'm like, I know one morning there's going to be like three people. Because I don't know why, who am I to be up here talking? And, uh, but I get what God's doing. Amen. And I don't feel worthy of it. I'm not. I got a lot of junk in my life. I'm being obedient to God as best I can. I'm trusting Him in every facet that I can. As we play a song, I I think the I thank you for being here. I hope you feel, you see, you know that this is not a thing that a group of people are doing. I hope you can feel the spirit of God, His Holy Spirit here. That he's moving, he's brought lives together, he's brought people together that feel a call to ministry, to, to specific things, uh, with substance abuse and children. If you don't see how we're working and making a difference and how we can make a difference together, God said, if you don't see how lives are going to be changed, ask you this morning, you may be there that in this stage in your life that you've seen that God had a path and a purpose. But you're over here. You've been scared to get on it. You've been scared to give it all up. To turn it all over. You think you, you can't live the life. You don't want to live the life. You, know, you don't want to try hard to be good enough you got things in your life that aren't good enough and you think, I'm going to get that right and then I'll get on your path, God. That's not how it works. He's just saying, this morning, the mercy, the grace is there for you to take Jesus. He, he went to the cross. He, he paid a price that, that we should have been, that should have been our life and our pain and our misery. He's already paid it. A gift he's freely given to whosoever. We'll believe on him. If everybody's head bowed this morning, Lord, I pray that there's hearts in here this morning that by faith, pray they put their names in that blank spot. Lord, if they've not been living a life of faith, that today could be the day that they make that decision. Lord, they can walk out of this building and say, by faith, I gave it all to God. I trusted when I couldn't trust myself, but I put my trust in Him. I pray for our congregation. I pray for me, our leadership. I pray for uh, everybody in this church, our youth. Lord, I pray that we would develop people and disciple service of you, God. And that we'd build this story after story.